Before we get started, I just want to say that this is a subject with personal meaning for me, as my paternal grandparents died from smoking-related causes. So China not only has the largest population in the world, but it also has the most smokers in the world. 53% of the adult males in China smoke. Half of those people started before the age of 20. 300 million Chinese smoke, and some 700 million are affected by the secondhand smoke from that. That is larger than the populations of Indonesia and the United States combined. Nearly the entirety of this titanic market is controlled by a single company, China Tobacco. The company produces some 2.3 trillion cigarette sticks a year. That is four times the production size of the second largest cigarette consuming country, the United States, and roughly the size of the next seven countries combined. It is most likely the fourth most profitable company in the entire country and responsible for a significant percentage of tax revenues for both the central and local governments. Knowing what we know about just how devastating smoking is to people's health, this is a major health problem for the most populous country in the world. The big problem with pushing anti-tobacco measures in China, though, is the incestuous relationship between the government, its regulator, so, so, you, so you would say, and the China tobacco monopoly. If you thought it was hard to fight against private tobacco companies like Philip Morris and British American Tobacco, imagine how hard it would be when the tobacco company is owned by the state itself. So let's start with the history of tobacco in China. Merchants first bought tobacco into China in the 16th century, but smoking only started to gain a hold in society during the 1890s. In the first half of the 20th century, foreign giant British American Tobacco BAT dominated the industry with some 80% of the market. James B. Duke, BAT's first chairman and namesake of Duke University, famously asked the globe be brought to him and then pointed at China as his key market. He knew exactly what was up. By 1937, the US-based company BAT, British American Tobacco, was selling 55 billion sticks a year in China, exceeding the revenues of all other foreign countries combined. Unfortunately for BAT, or British American Tobacco again, 1937 marked the high point for them in China. In 1941, the invading Japanese army seized all of the cigarette company's Chinese assets, and then in 1953, the newly formed People's Republic of China ejected BAT for good, nationalizing the country's entire cigarette industry. Production and industry control decentralized, so controlled at a provincial, meaning state level, by monopoly offices within other departments. Small factories popped up across the country, making and selling their own brands of cigarettes. The amazing thing is that even despite the disasters of the Great Leap Forward and its famines, the Chinese cigarette market continued to grow at a rapid pace. It only dropped from 11% annually to 5% growth. After Deng Xiaoping announced his economic reforms in the late 1970s, the China National Tobacco Corporation was established to centralize control over the many provincial cigarette companies that had popped up around the country. All revenues and profits would flow through CNTC to be redistributed between the central government, the party, and its provincial subsidiary governments. Then a few years later, in 1983, the central Chinese government established the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration, STMA, ostensibly to regulate SNTC. China Tobacco. The provincial Chinese governments did the same, establishing their own SMTAs to regulate their individual cigarette factories. This regulation structure mirrors that in the West, and gives the illusion of tobacco regulation. Of course, the reality, as it so often is in China, is not what it seems. So what is the reality of China Tobacco? This long convoluted history explains the twisted convoluted structure of China Tobacco. To the outsider, China Tobacco is a singular big monopoly company like Altria or British American Tobacco with a dedicated regulator that is controlled by the government. This tranquil veneer, though, hides a decentralized mess. China Tobacco and its regulator are basically the same thing, and so are all of its little provincial subsidiaries. The provincial governments deeply depend on the revenues provided by the 20% tax on the production and sale of tobacco by these individual cigarette monopolies. They also like the jobs. China Tobacco 
directly or indirectly employs half a million workers in varied areas across China. Tobacco leaf production is considered, quote unquote, the pillar of the economy in poor areas that otherwise struggle to generate jobs. Thus, in order to preserve these monopolies, provincial governments pass protectionist measures to protect their local China tobacco affiliates and factories, regardless of how efficient or productive those affiliates and factories are. Over time, though, the central authorities have consolidated these subsidiaries together to create national brands with prestige and meaning, with the intention of eventually taking them abroad to compete against cigarettes like uh, Lucky Strike and, of course, Marlboro. China Tobacco is the only legitimate buyer of tobacco leaf in China and produces a third to maybe 40% of global production. In 2011, the monopoly delivered an estimated $95 billion in profits to the central government, which is basically around a stunning 7.5% of total central government revenue. Considering the market continues to grow at some 10% annually, what it is today is kind of baffling to think about. Assuming on how you do the accounting, this $95 billion plus 10% uh, growth would make China Tobacco the fourth most profitable company in the country, only trailing two of China's biggest banks and one member of its petroleum duopoly. The Chinese smoking market is so large that one foreign tobacco company executive mused, thinking about Chinese smoking statistics is like trying to think about the limits of space. This has a double meaning. Because I'm not sure if you are aware, but smoking kills. In 2012, 1.2 million Chinese people a year die of smoking-related illnesses. That is 90 times more than those dying from HIV and AIDS. The Chinese smoker today has a life expectancy 15 years shorter than the average non-smoker. In other words, and this is a remarkable statistic if you think about it, a third of all Chinese men now aged 29 or younger will eventually die prematurely of smoking-related illnesses. What is even more concerning is that people are getting hooked younger and younger. The average age someone starts smoking has, fall, has fallen from 22 in the 1980s to 19.7 today. So this is getting worse each year that China does nothing about a smoking industry. Sadly to say, anti-smoking efforts are, to say the least, feeble. China has strong anti-smoking laws on paper, but in reality they are patchily enforced. Nevertheless, a number of public intellectuals and health officials have taken the lead to push greater enforcement of anti-smoking laws throughout the country. These are laws that are already on the books. They just need to be enforced. In a country where political activism and public movements are not encouraged, the fact that people are actually doing this and succeeding in small ways is pretty remarkable. Foreign tobacco companies have had a small hand in muddling things up as well. British American tobacco never deviated from its goal of returning to China after being injected in the 1950s. During the 1970s economic reforms, they looked at ways to partner with China Tobacco to cross-share brands. It did not get very far. BAT quickly realized that China Tobacco only wanted to acquire foreign technology and management skills without giving up anything, and so pulled back out. But before they did, they used their skill in undermining anti-smoking efforts abroad to cast doubt on the effects of secondhand smoking and water down anti-smoking marketing regulations under the guise of marketing freedom. But I do not want to overstate BAT's impact. You can't blame foreigners for the smoking situation in China. The majority of profits go to the local and central governments, not to evil tobacco barons in countries abroad. As they like to say, it is hard to get someone to understand something if their paycheck depends on them not getting it. In the apparent view of the Chinese leadership, China tobacco brings good, well-paying jobs, and that matters even if the jobs are an indirect cause of people dying. At a legislative meeting in 2007, Deputy Director of the SMTA, uh, which is China Tobacco's regulator, Zhang Baozhen, supposedly the regulator of tobacco, remind you, said, We attach great importance to the notion that smoking is harmful to health, but the absence of cigarettes will undermine the stability of the country. I will now point out that in the 25-member Politburo that runs the country, just five smoke. A number of those people are on the Central Standing Committee. 
Of course, this view, the, that of the leadership, I mean, discounts the negative externalities associated with taking care of those suffering from late-stage smoking-related illnesses. Healthcare costs for these are merely delayed, waiting to hit later on when people in their societies can least afford them. And Chinese people have proven time and time again that their environmental and public health issues matter to them. The more that people see their relatives and their friends die of smoking-related illnesses while not being able to afford treatment, the more people get angry at the government for not doing something about it. And that is the sort of thing that the Chinese Communist Party leadership really does care about. Thanks for watching. Like I said, my grandparents died from smoking, so this is near and dear to my heart. Thanks to cigarettes, they died before I was born, and I never got to know or even meet them. Smoking kills. If you're a current smoker, it is never too late to start quitting. I hope you can. Your life depends on it. Alright, good night everyone.